Okay, so this is the traditional uh, presentation we're going to go over real quick. And then uh, we are then going to meet Rick Hill also inside Spatial, which is a VR app that we'll, uh, we'll discuss in a minute. So I'm going to get right into this. Today, we're going to talk about engaging users with virtual reality. What I want to do is talk briefly about what VR is and what it's actually capable of doing. And then Rick and I will talk a little bit about how we um, set up a art gallery for the Lipa Ratner Museum in VR. And Rick also um, is going to talk about a dissection uh, piece of a frog that he did with photogrammetry. And, and you'll get to see how beautiful it is in VR. So we'll do that here in a few too. And then we're going to experience Spatial, which is a VR platform that enables people to collaborate in a virtual 3D space. Immersive technologies. And so you've probably heard this term a bunch. Um, and immersive technologies imitate or extend our physical world via digital simulations to give us the sense of immersion, right? So to be completely absorbed into something. So when Rick and I are in VR, we are completely immersed. And you'll learn, like, if you're, if you're in VR sort of like through your web browser, or if you're on your phone, you're still kind of immersed, but you're still looking at a two-dimensional screen. Whereas when we're in VR, it's three-dimensional. X, R, that's extended reality. The X is just a variable that can stand for anything. But right now, that X stands for 360-degree imagery or 360-degree virtual reality, true virtual reality. Augmented reality, which we're not going to get into today, but just think Pokemon Go. Um, mixed reality is the Microsoft version of kind of mixing augmented and virtual realities. Um, and spatial computing was a term that was used by a company called Byte, uh, Magic Leap, similar to mixed reality, and then hologram. So it's, it's extended reality is the full spectrum of immersive technology. So the question is, you know, can immersive technologies improve learning? and provide more engaging collaborative experiences? And the answer is simple. For, from my perspective, it's an emphatic yes, it can. Um, and I wanted to point out two really great reports. Um, these are really good reports. And just think about it, for example, if you, and you're gonna see with, with Rick's um, frog dissection piece, is that you can, you can create experiences that don't exist in the real world. We can travel all over the world instantly um, and safely, for that matter, um, in virtual reality. So field trips and all this. We can also see the invisible. So I can go inside a atom or a cell. I can bring a heart into my shared space and extend it to the point where it's humongous and I can walk in it. You can't obviously do that in, real, in the real world. Um, so those experiences, those learning experiences are memorable. You will not forget that experience. So just one quick example, um, learning in 3D. This is a program called Anatomy X. And so this was a co-location study session. So this is um, with the HoloLens and the Magic Leap. And so we're, this is what I'm looking at. This is a digital cadaver in my space. So this is augmented reality. And as I look over the body, you can see the parts are being labeled. But then I can walk through it and the parts dissolve. And I'm still learning about um, this the human body. Um, now I can read about the human body all day long and that's great. I will learn that way. But um, this is an experience, especially when it's completely immersive, when you're inside this body that you really, you won't forget anytime soon. And then this, you can see that that's an iPad that I'm looking at. There's two girls studying for an anatomy and physiology exam. This is obviously pre COVID, but they can, they can still do this anywhere. Um, and so they're, identifying and they were able to take parts of the heart apart 
um, and study the heart this way. And so, again, you do not forget this experience. And these girls did come back to me and said they aced their anatomy and physiology, at least that one exam on the heart um, versus the models. And plus, we have infinite storage space now, you know. You have 3D models that are stored in labs and stuff, and, and they take space, right? They take up space. In this case, you can have almost an infinite amount of 3D models. Getting into virtual reality is, so it's, it's really a computer just tricking your brain into believing that you're in a different environment. So it's a simulation. Um, and so the newer headsets use uh, six degrees of freedom. It's often called six DOF. And that basically tracks the whole room VR experience. So you get the freedom to explore locations like art galleries, um, interact with objects like dissected frogs. Um, and even if you want to have fun, you can maybe dodge some virtual bullets. So 3DOF is like, think of Google Cardboard. Um, you got just three degrees of freedom. So when you look around with Google Cardboard or like a, a phone app, you're kind of moving the space with the device. Whereas six off six degrees of freedom, you're in the space, the space is static, but you move around it like you would a regular room or a classroom. So I always like to show these pictures. So this is a student trying VR for the first time. This is a couple years ago, but I just love working with people that have ex that experienced VR for the first time because they're usually blown away by it. So what we did is we actually added, so we have a, quite a few VR apps um, and we have catalog them. So if, if a student is doing research on, let's say, Stonehenge, they can do a search and they can find books and videos and articles on Stonehenge, but they can also find a virtual reality experience. So they might not be able to travel to Stonehenge, but with a VR headset, they can go there and it's like they're there. It's pretty incredible. And then another uh, example I'd love to show is this student came into the lab um, a while back and, and uh, he, he's he's um, partially blind in one eye. He really wanted to try VR, but it was kind of kind of intimidated by it. And I said, well, why don't you at least try it? And if you don't like it, just take the headset off. So you can see by the smile, you know, he was truly blown away. So I put a program on called Tilt Brush, and he was able to go in and paint in virtual reality in 3D, and it was very vivid for him. And he told me later that it actually helped increase his peripheral vision um, to his functioning eye. So um, again, a smile tells the story. Um, this is spatial, and that's a 360 image. And what I've done is created a, a skybox or a sphere. And what's cool is you can, you can extend this and create your environment. This is a little different than what Rick has done with the Leaper Ratner Museum, but you can see now I'm in a different classroom. Eventually this will be video and it'll be moving. But anyway, I'm inside here. But I also created a galaxy, so it's kind of a great way to get in and see um, various galaxies surrounded by you instead of on a flat page. And then this was a, a fairly large group tour, and this does not do it any justice because we're looking at it in two dimensions. But you can see there's all these avatar people. They look like cartoons in this case. Um, when we're in spatial, you'll see that Rick and I actually look like us. Um, it's a it's a really great uh, 3D scanning, uh, almost LiDAR scan of us. Um, but you can see that this is pretty incredible. Um, I can move around and, and look around and see this uh, gorgeous landscape. Um, and so there's a group of us, so you can take class field trips anywhere. Oh, and here we are on Mars uh, looking at the rover. Um, just a really cool way to share an experience virtually. This was a fun day. Um, I, I was able to finally get Charlie Crisp to come tour the, the innovation lab on the Seminole campus. Um, he was uh, very interested in the VR, so we got him to try it for the first time, and I thought it was pretty cool that he actually tried it here. This was really cool, I thought. I was invited, to, since I've been working with Spatial for a long time, um, they had Joanna Stern and Christopher Mims from the Wall Street Journal. They wanted to try out spatial, so they came in and they invited some people in there to kind of hang out with them and they asked questions and all this. And then, like, within the week, I was flipping through the TV and I saw Joanna Stern on CNBC. And it was so interesting. I just felt like I knew her. Hey, it's me. Yeah, Joanna Stern. I, you didn't recognize me? You know, like my, my new look? But really, 
that that's me. Well, this is me. This is real life me, and that's avatar virtual reality me. But actually, I'm getting a little tired from working from home in the same space, so I'm going to go back in here. I signed up for a spatial account on the company's website and uploaded a photo of myself. Using some machine learning, it turned that into my avatar. Then I downloaded the spatial app on this new $299 Oculus Quest 2. It works on the older one too. It also works on a Microsoft HoloLens augmented reality headset. Oh, which, you know, just cost $3,500. All right, let's do it. You don't need any extra hardware with those headsets. All the head and hand tracking just works. When I move my head, so does my avatars. When I move my hands, so does my avatars. Then you can join one of the spaces Spatial makes. So with Spatial, they now have it set to where you can use a desktop or a tablet. You can also use iOS 13 and up or Android 9 and up. So you can actually still interact on your phone. But the best way to do it is in VR or AR. So if you have a headset and now, for example, the Quest is getting more affordable. But there's the Oculus Quest 2. They, they're $300. They just announced that they're gonna they're gonna double the storage space on this, um, and it's gonna be the same price. So three hundred dollars. You don't have to be connected to a computer, which is nice. It is owned by Facebook, so they do have it set to where eventually, I think by twenty twenty three, you're gonna need to have a Facebook account. I know people freak out over that sometimes, but just create a, a generic account and just kind of do it that way, um, and then you won't have to worry about any of your personal info out there. So I can see up here at the top that Rick is in here. Rick. Thanks, Chad. Hi, everyone. My name is Rick Hill, and I work at St. Petersburg College as an instructional design specialist. Now, what you're looking at is not really me. It's an avatar. And that avatar is actually a mere image of me. I'm actually looking at my own reflection inside of Spatial's mirror. Now, I could put the mirror anywhere, but for presentation's sake, I thought you'd like to see kind of what I look like. And so, if you choose to do so, you can create an avatar of yourself to come into Spatial. Now, Spatial is a collaborative environment, and you can bring in 32 students for free into this environment. And if you have a little bit of facial recognition, they can get to know you. Again, it's the user's discretion whether they choose to do so or not, but if they don't, they can have a generic persona. Okay, today I'm gonna to take you through four rooms. They're all mock-ups of things that you could be doing. These aren't real lesson plans. They're just generalizations of the creative things that you might wanna to do to give you ideas to do things for yourself. Because really, Spatial isn't any different than PowerPoint. PowerPoint, you bring in PDFs, you bring in videos, you bring in objects, including 3D objects, and it's exactly the same way here. The difference is the students are all here too. So if I were going to be doing a lab, and this is my first example, um, I would like to do a virtual lab with a bunch of students, right? Now I could show them this in this nice auditorium, and this is a dissected frog. I could use tools and manipulate them. I could show the students how or where to cut. But in this particular situation, I could also take this frog, and because not everyone can see it in the room, I could expand this frog out to be ginormous in this space. And then I could show everyone the frog. But if you see over there, I have another frog. And if I were really doing a lab, I would probably want to have each student have their own frog. So, one way to do that is to simply duplicate the frog and send it out to each student. Spatial allows you to copy and duplicate objects in almost an unlimited way, just like Chad was talking about earlier. Now, if you would like to do this, you can bring in your own 3D objects. This frog, I happen to scan on my phone and then bring it in with a variety of tools. However, you can purchase or find a multitude of free 3D objects on the web to bring into Spatial. Not only that, Spatial actually has its own interface to bring in 3D objects. 
and I want to show you how to do that. So there's a menu system and if you choose the search feature type in frog it's over there, hit done you can get your own 3D models for free. To use. Again, it's a virtual world that gives you a lot of variety and a lot of tools to actually be able to build things. So, you've seen this example. You realize that students can now have an entire lab full and you could walk through the lab and monitor them but things could become even higher order. So let's take a look at what else you could do. Here's a setup for a surgery. Now, I'm not a medical professional. I've only set this up with basic tools and my own limited understanding, but I can create almost anything in this environment. If you look, these are laparoscopic tools over here, and this thing over here is a frangiscope and it's used for intubating patients. So for respiratory therapy, for nursing, for a variety of medical um, simulations, you could actually set up your faculty with what they need. Just make sure that the objectives are being met. So for instance, here's the pharyngoscope. I can actually place the pharyngoscope into the patient's mouth and just try to get it into the correct position because it is a delicate procedure. And over here, I've got these probes. And if you look at the wall over there behind me, um, I can actually place these probes or cut through the navel or do whatever the procedure is. Spatial also animates. If you look here, this is just a mock-up of a heart, but this model heart is beating in spatial. And if it's too gross, we can turn it off. There we go. Basically, spatial offers you the ability to recreate and simulate learning environments. And they can be whatever you want. So that's what today is about. This room is a science lab. It's got dissected frogs. It has a patient, it has this operating room and all the facilities. If you wanted to do a training, you could actually have a collaborative learning environment that's facilitated by an instructor to have students at their stations doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. You know, if this patient was actually under cardiac arrest, we could be doing CPR on this patient. I could be pumping, somebody else could be actually breathing into the person's mouth. All this can be done, all this can be done with virtual reality. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to take you to another room and this is the Liparatna Museum. It is this way, these are portals. You can jump from different rooms to room to room. And this is something that I actually built for the intent of um, some educational outreach. So let's take a trip. Bye. Welcome to the Lipa Ratner Museum. This museum is basically a construct that I built for a web application. Um, during COVID, the museum was shut down and I thought it might be great for educational outreach to actually provide a place, a website, where students or patrons could come and visit and learn about art. And so I actually built the 3D model. Along the way, I bumped into Chad, and through our connections, um, Chad introduced me to VR. So we took one static phase of the model that I had created and made this into a VR version of the Leaper Ratner Museum. So I'm going to hop over here and I'm going to try not to get you dizzy. So I'm trying not to move my head too much. And I'm going to go down this hall. That's Abraham Ratner on the left there. And this is a historical 
catalog of some of his work. It's fairly linear. This is his older work. And as we progress through the gal gal gallery, excuse me, we will uh, see his more contemporary items before his passing. Um, as you can see, this idea of having a collaborative environment in a museum is neat because you can have students lined up all around me to the left and the right. And if I know something about this particular painting and its historical significance, I, and you know the symbolism with some of the characters, I can explain it to them and they can ask questions and learn about this. A lot of these paintings don't have a lot of textbook material behind them. So the word of mouth, the written record through the museum itself, and then just having patrons and students come through and ask questions is the best way to facilitate the learning of this environment. Now, uh, along the way, I was actually and recently asked this last week that I, if I could make um, this museum accessible for a faculty member and a student currently because that student has just come down with COVID and they're not going to be able to go on their uh, Basically, it's an objective of theirs to go to the museum on a field trip and the student is going to miss it. So the faculty member wanted to know if I could get them access um, to go into this museum. And yeah, I'm going to try to help them out and I'll let you know how that goes. So let me turn around here. And so these are Abraham Ratner's works. And in this area... We've got Esther Gentle's works, that's his wife, and Alan Lipa, that's his works, and that's actually Abraham Ratner's stepson. Okay, now we're going to go on our next step, and the th third leg of our journey is to Chichen Itza. And this basically is, I'm going to say, a case example of a field trip. So we're going to go to the Yucatan Peninsula, everybody. Here we go. Whoa. Welcome, everyone, to Chichen Itza. We are now on the Temple of Kukulkan. It is in the Yucatan Peninsula. And it's uh, about a thousand-year-old temple. And if you're there, you really aren't allowed to climb on it. But what's great about this is that we can actually climb up the steps and your students can come with you. And you can investigate and look at the, this wonderful architecture in this uh, World Heritage Site. So um, what I'd like to tell you is that uh, we could walk around this and if you were giving a history lesson, you could actually talk about it as, you know, if you're studying uh, Mayan history, you could talk about this. Or if you're looking at the architecture history, you could talk about that as well. But what's really neat is um, that I happen to find that uh, Spatial provided a couple of free models of other Mayan temples. All I had to do was search for them. So what I'd like to do here is give you an opportunity to build your own Mayan temple without having to go through what I did here. And all you need to do is open up a custom space, search for Mayan temple, and select that button when you're in your custom space called environment. And when you do so, you'll have a few little people in there on a grid and you will arrange the model in proportion to the scale that the people are. And when you click OK, you will get a large temple like this. So uh, our last step, guys, is to the planetarium. What you're looking at right now is a giant skybox planetarium. It's a, a galaxy map provided by NASA that was mapped inside of a sphere, much like Chad was talking about. Um, I kind of took his idea and turned it into a giant skybox for this room. And this planetarium could have uh, constellations, um, and it could actually work as a real planetarium. Um, I can even point at certain stars in the sky. 
Now, down below me is the Voyager spacecraft, and over here is the space shuttle with its rockets. And what's really neat about all this stuff is, again, these models were provided free by Spatial. Uh, it's not to mean that you can't bring in your own models that you acquire from Sketchfab or some other free resources. You could pay to have some really high-end anatomical models if you want to, and then bring them as, into this environment. But you know, if you had a bunch of students in here and you were studying the stars, this would be um, ideal, almost as if it were a real planetarium. Now, of course, uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, my last construction that I did. And this is pretty immersive. Um, when you come in here, you'll actually see this for yourself. And if you have 3D goggles, you'll see that the depth of field will make this seem really massive. But uh, there's the Hubble Space Telescope and there's the Earth. These are a couple models that I created. I just wanted to bring in just to show you kind of, you know, what could be done. But at this point, I just want to thank every single one of you for attending this meeting. You know, it shows that you have a vision for doing new things. And really, this is free. It's something that you should at least dabble with. If you don't have the VR headset, you can still build these environments and you can still have students come in through the browser. Um, if you've got the VR headsets, you can do so much more and it, it is so much more immersive. So at this point, um, Chad and I are going to meet you inside and I'm going to put up some information uh, for you guys to log into one of the rooms and then you can meet us in here and you can ask us any question you would like and uh, I can probably fill in there's so much more to talk about but I don't want to waste all your time I want you to come in here and we'll see you in a bit bye